The 17 News at Sunrise podcast is brought to you by Clinica Sierra Vista. Welcome back to the 17 News at Sunrise podcast, where we share your news on your schedule. Working in the spirit of the Golden Empire, this is 17 News at Sunrise. Morning here at 5 a.m. I'm Maddie Jansen alongside Alex Fisher. And some breaking news from overnight. Fire crews were called to a structure fire around 2.30 this morning in downtown Bakersfield. As you can see, crews had to cut into those garage doors to help get to the flames at this warehouse on Union Avenue near Truxton Avenue. No word on what may have caused the fire or if there were any injuries. Police are investigating a deadly hit and run crash in southwest Bakersfield. It happened around 845 last night on Ming Avenue east of Ash Road. Police say a Jeep was speeding when it was hit by an SUV. The man driving the Jeep was ejected and died. His passenger had to be extricated from the vehicle and was taken to the hospital with moderate injuries. BPD says the driver of the SUV ran away for, uh, uh, after the crash. It is unknown at this time if drugs and alcohol were factors. 503 now, there's growing fallout from the leaked Supreme Court draft opinion on abortion. People gathered across the country from both sides of the issue. NBC's Brie Jackson is in Washington this morning with the latest. Good morning, Alex, Maddie. An investigation into the leaked draft opinion is underway. The fallout is expected to spill into the midterm elections. Rise up for abortion! Rise, rise up for abortion! From New York City to San Francisco and cities in between, advocates on both sides of the abortion debate are energized. Abortion is not the only option. In fact, it's probably the worst option. The decision to make abortions illegal will not stop them from happening. It will only stop them from happening safely. The leaked document indicates justices are ready to strike down the landmark 1973 ruling establishing abortion rights nationwide. The idea that concerns me a great deal that we're going to, after 50 years, decide a woman does not have a right to choose within the limits of the Supreme Court decision. Should justices overturn Roe versus Wade, roughly 25 states will likely ban abortion. 13 of them have trigger laws, meaning it will be immediately outlawed. Meanwhile, states like Connecticut are taking steps to increase access to abortion services. Honor their choices. Respect the law that has stood for as long as I have been alive. The issue has long divided the country. A leak of this nature raises concerns about the future of abortion and politics within the high court. Because so much is based on trust, and this is as serious a violation of the promise to keep things secret as you could possibly imagine. Chief Justice John Roberts calls the leak a singular and egregious breach of trust and ordered an immediate investigation. Senate Democrats are now pushing for a federal law to protect abortion rights, but it's unlikely to get the votes needed to pass. In Washington, I'm Bree Jackson for 17 News. Also making news around the nation, Oklahoma Governor Kevin Stitt signing a Texas-style abortion ban yesterday. The law prohibits abortions after about six weeks of pregnancy. The Oklahoma Supreme Court denied an emergency request to temporarily halt the bill. The bill authorizes abortions if performed for medical emergencies. And there are no exceptions if the pregnancy is the result of rape or incest. Meanwhile, California lawmakers are vowing to protect abortion rights in the state while boosting resources and access. The leader of California's state Senate, Pro Tem Tony Atkins, announcing she will propose a state constitutional amendment to protect legal abortion here in California. That will make it crystal clear that reproductive rights in California, including and specifically abortion, are protected. The constitutional amendment will need to pass the legislature with a two-thirds vote by June 30th in order to be on the November ballot. California Planned Parenthood CEO Jody Hicks made it clear yesterday health centers are open and services are being provided. Her clinics and others gearing up for a potential post-Roe v. Wade world. According to Planned Parenthood's abortion access map, more than half of U.S. states have abortion restrictions, some that could become even stricter if the Supreme Court sticks with the draft decision leaked on Monday. 
anticipating a potential surge of out of state patients and with the goal to make it more accessible for those already in California. 13 bills circulating through the state legislature aim to boost the amount of providers, financial assistance for patients, and legal protections for health professionals who provide abortions. How might the court's apparent willingness to overturn Roe v. Wade affect us here at home? 17's Robert Price sought some answers and has this report. You've heard the debate over abortion itself with euphemisms like pro-life and pro-choice standing in for the termination of a pregnancy. But the debate today is not so much about abortion as it is about the leak of a Supreme Court draft decision, the ethics and the possible impact of that leak. Who benefits from the leak of the draft ruling overturning Roe v. Wade? And how do we judge the breach from an ethical standpoint? First, who gains politically from Monday's report from Politico that the nation's highest court is poised to strike down the landmark 1973 decision and hand the abortion issue to individual states? Theoretically, says Bakersfield attorney David Torres, a local Democratic Party activist, both parties, Democrats and Republicans alike, will be energized and motivated to participate in the upcoming midterms, where Republicans are, by most accounts, likely to reclaim the majority in Congress. And it's going to mobilize Democrats to go out and vote, including women who may not be Democrats. But interestingly, I was also thinking the, the Republicans can also probably benefit. Ultimately, I think that it's going to rile up voters on both sides. Tiffany Santasolis, a philosophy professor and ethicist at CSU Bakersfield, looked at the leak from a different perspective. Is the unauthorized release of classified or privileged government documents ever justified? Might it be justified in this case? I think it's hard to say whether the method is ethical or not. We usually judge after the fact when we look at the consequences. What really concerns me more is the way in which this leak has brought to light your fundamental rights or your, your liberties are at the whim of a very secretive, unelected body. Leak or no leak, it was business as usual at the Bakersfield office of Planned Parenthood Marmonte, the women's health services nonprofit. The local director declined comment, but the national office said Planned Parenthood was already training clinicians to help accommodate those who come to California from other states where abortions have been banned or severely restricted. One thing is clear, both parties will use this draft ruling to point fingers and raise money. Already this morning, from the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, Republican David Valadeo is, quote, complicit in the crusade to end access to legal abortion. How will this leak affect the 2022 midterms? We'll see in the next few hours, days, and weeks. At Planned Parenthood in Bakersfield, Robert Price, 17 News. 5.09 is our time now, and our verdict watch continues as a Kern County jury deliberates the fate of Matthew Queen. Queen is accused of murdering and torturing Michael Holsenbake, a member of the so-called Bakersfield Three. Prosecutors say Queen and Bailey Despot tortured and killed Holsenbake, then dismembered his body in March 2018 over a stolen gun. The defense, however, argues Queen is not a murderer. They say it was Despot who, in the midst of a scuffle, dropped a 40-pound dumbbell on Holson Bake's head, killing him. Despot has not been seen since. Queen faces 35 charges, ranging from murder and torture to kidnapping, assault with a deadly weapon, and making illegal guns. Well, Maddie, this month actually marks the 10th anniversary of the very first Kern County Honor Flight. 21 veterans took that flight. Yesterday's held more than four times as many, all headed on what organizers call the trip of a lifetime. A chance to give military heroes the recognition many have been waiting for. Very emotional. Very, I, I don't know what else to say, just very emotional. I'm, I'm kind of lost for words. After the 44th Kern County Honor Flight took off Monday, more than 90 veterans are headed to the U.S. Capitol to tour their memorials and receive national honors. Many of those veterans received less than warm welcomes when they came home from service. Some of the guys just burned their uniforms because they didn't even want people to know that they were vets. But it's not just combat veterans receiving long overdue honors. We have two Rosies on this flight. Two Rosie the Riveters, women who stepped into manufacturing roles during World War II, will also make the trip to the Capitol. And they're 97 and 98. You would think they were 16 getting on this plane. I swear they're the cutest, spunkiest ladies of all time. Lynn Eckert is a Vietnam veteran. She was also the only female veteran on her honor flight last year. 
Back this year as a guardian, Eckert says it's important to recognize military women whose praises often go unsung. We serve too. You know, we need to be recognized too. Not so much for um, selfish reasons, but just to say, hey, we were a part of this country's history too, just like the men were. And guys, a big part of the honor flight is that welcome home ceremony to kind of give all these veterans a second welcome home. That'll be taking place at North High's gymnasium. Last time it was at the football field. This okay. time it's indoors at the gymnasium Wednesday at 6 p.m. Okay, so tonight at 6. Tonight is Thursday, Thursday at 6 p.m. Got my days mixed up. Yeah. yeah. All right, so it tomorrow night. It is such an incredible thing to be part of if you can be there for that. And, you know, another really incredible way to get involved if you are somebody, you know, has a little extra time on your hands, mm -hmm. go be a guardian. They yes. always need mm -hmm. guardians. It's not necessarily, every veteran doesn't come with their own guardian, a family member or anything mm -hmm. like that. They always need people to volunteer to take that spot. Um, yes. And I know it's, it's really an incredible opportunity. It's really rewarding. I was talking to Lynn, who you saw in that piece, and she said she went on the honor flight and enjoyed it so much that she wanted to pay it forward and come back as a that. guardian year after year. So it so is something cool. that's incredibly rewarding for these folks. All right, Chris, thanks for uh, highlighting those women. Absolutely. A solemn ceremony yesterday at the California Highway Patrol headquarters in Sacramento, the annual memorial service paying tribute to fallen heroes. In the CHP's 92 history, 92 year history, 232 officers have lost their lives. There is no California without courageous Californians determined to serve, determined to protect it. Yesterday marked the return of the memorial ceremony following its postponement, postponement for two years because of the pandemic. Meantime, a new portrait of a fallen hero was unveiled yesterday at Bakersfield's Portrait of a Warrior Gallery. The Memorial Gallery features the portraits of post 9-11 warriors from Kern County who were killed in action or died as a result of wounds suffered on the battlefield. Each portrait tells the story of a young service member inlaid with many portraits that help people understand who that hero was as a person. Yesterday's portrait honored Staff Sergeant David Perry, Kern County's first National Guardsman to die in post 9-11 conflict. Sergeant Perry died in 2003 during service in Iraq when a package exploded. It's reported that he saved 40 lives. David was what we called the, the army sergeant in the army. He, he knew a little bit about everything, so he'd done quite a few jobs. And uh, just an amazing guy, cared about his troops. Um, everybody, everybody that knew him loved him. If you knew him, you loved him. Um, he always had a quick sense of humor, uh, kind of a sharp wit, um, but he knew his stuff. And he was just a, a really good dude. We, we all really cared a lot about him. You can visit the gallery to see this portrait and others Tuesday through Thursdays on Saturday and on Saturdays from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Now to the coronavirus and the CDC is once again recommending Americans wear masks on planes, trains and buses. The agency issued a statement yesterday saying Americans aged two and older should wear a well-fitting mask on public transportation as well as in crowded areas like airports and train stations. This comes despite the April 18th decision by a federal judge declaring the mask mandate unlawful. The Justice Department filed a motion to appeal the ruling. And now the latest COVID-19 case numbers in Kern County. Public Health yesterday announced 23 new deaths attributed to the virus and 212 new positive cases. That's about 60 cases more than our update on Friday. Again, we get updates twice a week currently from Public Health. State data shows 15 patients hospitalized across Kern five in the ICU. More than 2,300 lives have been lost in Kern County since the start of the pandemic. The Boys and Girls Clubs of Kern County continue offering free COVID-19 vaccines at clinics throughout Bakersfield and Lamont. The organization is hosting a clinic today at the Armstrong Youth Center on Nile Street from 430 to 7. Moderna, Johnson & Johnson and Pfizer vaccines will be available. For more information or a list of upcoming vaccine clinics, just go to our website, KGET.com. 17 Health Watch now. If you drink coffee from a disposable cup, and who doesn't once in a while, you could be ingesting tiny plastic particles. A study in the journal Environmental Science and Technology found single-use paper coffee cups are lined with a very thin plastic film. Researchers say that lining releases more than 5 trillion plastic nanoparticles per liter when hot liquid is poured into a 12-ounce single-use cup. 
That amount is well under safe human consumption levels set by the FDA, but some say experts say that it may be time to reevaluate those guidelines. So if you're going to a coffee shop this morning, yeah. getting a cup of joe. Maybe, maybe bring your reusable it, cup. Exactly. <laughs> In education news this morning, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools has announced the three finalists for Teachers of the Year. Here they are. Kurt Keckley, a special education teacher at Frontier High School. Kelsey Linnell, a K-8 literacy intervention teacher at Elk Hill School. And Hannah Rawberger, an 8th grade history teacher at Paul L. Cato Middle School. The finalists are eligible to apply for the California Teacher of the Year program. So congratulations to those teachers and, of the year. And to all who are nominated exactly. at their own schools. Yeah, just a huge thank you for what you do to our community. Your time's 540 now, and now to a project six months in the making that's already a big hit with kids in one Southwest Bakersfield neighborhood. City officials cut the ribbon yesterday on the new playground at Quailwood Park. $345,000 was spent to make improvements and put in new equipment. It was paid for by funds from Measure N, a one cent sales tax increase approved by voters in 2018. Yes, we have to address many of the pressing issues facing our community and we are doing so. Public safety is the number one priority. But in addition to that, longer term, we also have to make investments in our parks, in our public spaces, and we have to make investments to our, for our children. Let me tell you, my kids are really excited for this. Grandma lives just down the street and they have been waiting for this park to be reopened. Uh, and it definitely needed that facelift. In all, $4 million has been set aside to fund improvements at 12 different parks in town. It was a big day for local nonprofits yesterday in Kern County. The Kern Community Foundation and Kern County nonprofits rang in the kickoff for Give Big Kern downtown at the Liberty Bell. Give Big Kern is an opportunity for all of Kern County to come together as one community raising funds do uh, and dollars and pledging volunteer hours for local nonprofits. At last check, nearly $800,000 had been raised for local nonprofits. Working in the spirit of the Golden Empire, this is 17 News at Sunrise. The 17 News at Sunrise podcast is a production of KGET and Nexstar Media Group. For more on all of the headlines in today's show, head to KGET.com.